This is Economics 252, uh, Financial Markets. Uh, and uh, I'm R Bob Schiller. And let me begin by uh, introducing the um, teaching fellows for this course. Uh, and so I have them up here. Uh, we have uh, five teaching fellows at this time. Uh, and uh, they're from all over. I like to put their pictures up so you'll know who they are. Uh, we, uh, the teaching fellows are very international, uh, and that uh, reflects my intention to make this a course which is uh, also very international, because finance is something about the whole world today, not just the United States. So we cover the world very well <laughs> with our TAs. Uh, Usman Ali is from Pakistan, uh, Lahore. Uh, and uh, uh, graduated from the uh, LUMS, La Lahore University of Management Science. He's a PhD candidate now in economics uh, and uh, is doing his doctoral dissertation on uh, stock analysts' recommendations and their relation to returns in the stock market. He's also interested in behavioral finance, which is the application of psychology to finance. Um, the second teaching assistant, I see him right there, you could raise your hand, is Santosh Anagal, who is uh, our representative of the United States, uh, although he seems to have connections to India as well. Uh, he's a, a, he actually has a publication already in uh, the American Economic Review on the return to capital with Ghana, and he d did this jointly with the chairman of the economics department here, uh, Chris Udry. And he has spent time in India looking at uh, uh, village economies. And you were going to be giving away cows. Did you do that? No, but yeah, I'm still working on cows, but we're not giving them away. Okay. That's the last time you'll hear about cows in this course. <laughs> but the idea was to give cows away to village <coughs> farmers and to observe the outcome. It's a big change in some of these very poor villages to get a cow. Uh, uh, Christian Awukubudu is from Ghana, uh, Accra, but he again went to college in the United States at Morehouse College, and he is also a PhD candidate uh, in economics at Yale. Uh, and he's been doing research on financial markets in developing countries. Uh, Yashin Duan uh, is uh, uh, from China. Uh, she got her Undergraduate degree from Nanjing University? No? You are from Nanjing. Did I get a detail wrong? Where did you go to college? Okay, well, so um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, she uh, is also a PhD candidate in economics, uh, is doing research on the behavior of options prices and a phenomenon called the options smile. And she's smiling at me <laughs> right now. Uh, and uh, she is uh, also interested in behavioral finance, which is uh, great to me because that's one of my interests. Uh, she is shown here uh, standing precariously on a cliff. Uh, makes me nervous to look at it, <laughs> overlooking Machu Picchu in Peru. Uh, and she also loves astronomy, which is incidentally an interest of mine too. Uh, but you won't hear about it again in this course. Uh, and finally, Shaolan Zhu uh, is uh, our, our fifth uh, teaching assistant. And she's also from China, uh, Hubei province. Uh, went, graduated from Wuhan University and uh, a PhD candidate in economics at Yale and is doing uh, research on bank mergers. Okay. So um, let me say. I've been teaching this course now for over 20 years, uh, and I'm very proud of all of my alumni. Many of them are in the field of finance. Uh, in fact, I like sometimes when I give I give a lot of public talks. When I give a talk on Wall Street or even somewhere else in the world, I sometimes ask my audience, did you take my course? Uh, and it's not infrequent that I'll get one or even two people raising their hand that they took uh, Economics 252 from me. So, uh, but I'm also proud of my alumni in this course who 
uh, are not in the world of finance. I think this course is, goes beyond. It's not just for people who are planning careers in finance. Um, because uh, finance is a very important technology. And it's very important to know finance to understand what happens in the real world. Just about any human endeavor involves finance. Now, you might say, I could be a poet, and what does that have to do with finance? Well, it probably ends up having something to do with finance because as a poet, you probably want to publish your poetry, right? And you're going to be talking to publishers, and before you know it, they're going to be talking about their financial situation and how you fit into it. So I believe it's <laughs> fundamental and very important, and so I think uh, you uh, will find this course as not a vocational course, not primarily a vocational, vocational course, but an intellectual course about how things wor really work. I mean, I see finance as the underpinning of so much that happens. It's a powerful force that goes behind the scene, uh, and I hope we can draw that out in this course. There is another course in, in that we have two basic courses in finance for undergraduates at Yale. Uh, the other one is Economics 251, uh, Financial Theory. This is Financial Markets. That one is Financial Theory. Last year, uh, it was taught by Raphael Rameau. Uh, that was because uh, John Janakopoulos, who usually teaches the course, uh, was on leave. And so, um, and so we had to find someone else. But I, I assume that next uh, fall, John Janakopoulos will be again teaching 251. So what happened? Why do we have these two courses? Well, it was something like eight years ago that uh, we re re uh, reached the present uh, um, situation with two <coughs> finance courses. And John Janakopoulos and I had a meeting, and we tried to divide up the subject matter of finance into two courses. And so we thought financial theory and financial markets would be the two. Uh, but the problem was that both John and I are interested both in theory and, uh, the, and applications. Uh, John Janakopoulos is actually chief economist for a large investment company called Ellington Capital in Greenwich, Connecticut, which you'll see a lot in the news. It's been very successful. Uh, and so he's very much interested in the real world. Uh, and so am I interested in financial theory. And so we find it. We decided, after talking about it, that we really can't divide up the subject matter of finance into separate courses on theory and practice. Uh, the either one, if you tried to do one alone, it would not work. Uh, so what we decided to do was to divide it up imperfectly. And there may be some repetition between our two courses. Both of them uh, are self-contained courses. So you could take either 251 or 252, or you could take both. Uh, and I think maybe the best option is to take both if you're really interested in the subject matter. Um, but uh, it is true, though, that his course is more tuned into theoretical detail than mine. Uh, and uh, John is a mathematical economist. Uh, and and I, we both love mathematics, but maybe John is going to do more of it than, than I am. This course actually will not use a heavy amount of, of mathematics. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it so that people who are not comfortable with a lot of math would take this course. Uh, and so, um, but I. Uh, so I wanted to emphasize that this is, um, I've, I, I've said that it's, I, I think this course is vocational preparation in a sense. I pride myself on the fact that people who've taken this course find it useful in their subsequent lives. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that it's uh, really interesting. <laughs> At least I find it really interesting, uh, and so uh, I hope that you will too. Now, I don't know. I may be different than other people. Uh, I think organic chemistry is really interesting. Uh, how many of you <laughs> have that feeling? Uh, 
we got a show of hands. Who's interested in organic chemistry? Uh-oh, I'm not getting a lot of <laughs> hands raised. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I've never taken a course in it, but I've started reading it lately out of just my broad intellectual um, interests. Uh, that is a course that has a bad reputation, doesn't it? Because people say, I've got to take that if I want to be a, a medical, pre-med. Um, but, you know, to me, uh, there's a lot of detail in organic chemistry. To me, when you read the detail, you're getting into uh, something deep and important about the way everything works. And so I start to find it interesting. So I don't know how people feel about taking Maybe I'm turning you off <laughs> by saying this. There's going to be a lot of detail in this course, but I, I maybe I made a big mistake by likening it to an organic chemistry course. I, I don't mean to turn you off. Uh, the idea in this course is that um, it being a financial markets course is you have to know how the world works. We're going to be thinking about that in connection with financial theory, but we, we have to get into the details. Uh, and so we are going to be um, we are going to be learning about uh, facts, uh, and so um, so let me uh, uh, let me start by talking about the, the textbook. So the uh, the principal textbook uh, is uh, Frank Fabosi. Uh, uh, the other authors are Modigliani, Jones, and Ferry, um, and um, Foundations of Financial Markets and Institutions. Uh, this textbook uh, is uh, very detailed, and uh, it uh, it may be some. I've had some reaction to students. It's more than I wanted to know, uh, but. Uh, I actually had a great experience uh, reading it. Uh, I actually, it was an earlier edition when I first assigned this book in the year 2000. I took it with me on vacation. I was going to the Bahamas with my family and with uh, Jeremy Siegel's family. Uh, we'll come back to Jeremy Siegel in a minute. Uh, and I, I sat down by the pool with this book. Uh, other people were reading novels and I don't know what, but I was reading um, Fabosi et al. And I had such a great time with it. Uh, so I'm telling you, that was my experience. Maybe it was because it was filling in gaps in my knowledge, things I've always wanted to know and was always curious about. Um, that's part of what you have to develop when you get interested in a field is some sense of curiosity about all the details. So I read the whole book. Uh, it's 650 pages uh, on that. Or maybe I kind of speed read it because I knew a lot of it. It might take you a little longer to get through it. Um, and so I wanted you to have the same experience. Um, so I've been assigning this book now. It's now uh, in another edition. And uh, uh, Fabosi is working on a fourth, a next edition. I forget what number. Uh, and uh, so I've been assigning. I've gotten some complaints from students that this book is tough going uh, because there's so much information in it. Uh, I used to tell people that I'm assigning the whole book and you have to know everything in the book, okay? Um, and that's a little ambitious. I, I finally backed down because uh, I met uh, a man on Wall Street, a very prominent Wall Street uh, person, and he said, you know, my son started to take your course. Uh, and I said, what do you mean started to take your course? And he said, well, he dropped out when he saw this book uh, and my requirements. Uh, I didn't like that. I don't want students to drop out. Uh, so what I decided is to say that you need to know the whole book in the sense that you need to know all the key terms and key points. Now, if you look at the structure of this book, it has sections that say key points and key terms. Okay, that anything that's mentioned there is fair game for me <laughs> in an exam, and so uh, that's the way I've done it. So uh, there are key points and key terms. Also, anything in my lectures, of course, is fair game for the exam. Uh, and uh, well, let me also add, I've got a reading list that has clickable things on it and also things that are on reserve in the library. Anything that's clickable is required reading, OK? I don't expect you to go to the library, however, because uh, I, uh, I think that we're moving into an age where uh, you uh, tend to want to be online, right? So 
the library books are all optional uh, background. Uh, so Fabozzi, a faculty member here at Yale, uh, has offered to uh, give me at least, we have at least one chapter from the, the new edition that hasn't come out yet. And I'm going to put that on reserve uh, uh, in the library. Uh, but again, I think that the edition that you have is, uh, is reasonably up to date. And so that's all that I'm expecting you to read. Uh, the other author, Franco Modigliani, uh, in the book, the second author, uh, was, a, was my teacher at MIT. Uh, he died on, in 2003. Uh, he also is a Nobel Prize winner uh, and I think is a remarkable intellect. Uh, so uh, this book, uh, Fabozzi et al., uh, Fabozzi, Modigliani, Jones and Ferry, is a very solid book about financial markets. Uh, the second book that I'm assigning is uh, Jeremy Siegel, uh, Stocks for the Long Run. Uh, so uh, this is an old friend of mine. I met him in graduate school. Uh, funny story, I met him because at MIT they, they uh, signed us all up for chest x-rays alphabetically. That's the way MIT does things, <laughs> orderly way. And Schiller and Siegel are next to each other in the alphabet. So I was standing in line with him for an x-ray and I got to talking with him and I've known him uh, ever since. It, a funny coincidence is that since our books, uh, our names are close in the alphabet, you often find our books right together in bookstores because Schiller and Siegel, if they were shelving alphabetically, would end up together. Uh, he wrote a book called Stocks for the Long Run starting in 1993 and it just, just came out with the fourth edition. Uh, and so uh, that book was a bestseller. I think it's sold over a half a million copies. Uh, I'm not sure where it is up now, but uh, it has done very well. It's been a perennial classic. Uh, and it's really a, it's, it emphasizes the long run performance of the stock market, but it's really a, uh, a general um, treatise on financial markets. Uh, and I've, I get a very good reaction from this students for this book. This one is very readable. It's not so intense as Fabozzi et al. Uh, Jeremy Siegel has the unique distinction. Business Week uh, asked, uh, did a poll asking uh, MBAs who is their favorite professor. Uh, this was about 10 years ago. And they ranked business school professors according to their popularity. He came out number one in the United States as business school professor. And uh, so I think you'll like this book. The, the next book is my own uh, called Irrational Exuberance. And this is the last book. Uh, that's a phrase that was coined by Alan Greenspan uh, in 1996. Uh, and it refers to the stock market boom of the uh, 2000s, uh, of the 1990s, and the, the boom that, and the bust. <laughs> well, I, I think it's related to the bust that came out later and after 2000. I wrote this book in 2000, uh, right at the peak, of, fortunately, right at the peak of the stock market. Uh, and, but what I'm assigning to you is the second edition, which came out in 2005, uh, pretty much at the peak of the housing market. Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, both the housing market and the stock market uh, in these different books. Um, these books are all on sale at Labyrinth Books. Uh, which is an independent bookstore here in New Haven. I, I put it there because, uh, well, I think uh, n n the major chain bookstores fulfill an important function, but I like also to support independent bookstores. And I don't know if you know the story, Labyrinth Books uh, is independent. It's not a chain. Uh, and independent bookstores are trying, to, struggling to survive. This is finance. <laughs> in the book business, uh, there's something uh, difficult. Uh, about maintaining an independent operation. So uh, Labyrinth was at Columbia University and Yale. For some reason, they shut down their Columbia bookstore, but they've opened up now in Princeton. Uh, there was this famous bookstore on Princeton on Nassau Street called Micawber's, which is a wonderful bookstore. And I've been in there a number of times. But they just went out of business. Uh, so Labyrinth has moved in to take their place. Uh, 
Anyway, that's where the books, all the books are, and um, um, and they are. I checked; they're available now. Then, um, so uh, we're going to have uh, all these lectures are Monday and Wednesday. We're going to have TA sections on the second part of the week. We're going to ask you to look at your schedule sometime before our next lecture and think about when you can come to a teaching assistant <coughs> section. Uh, but they will be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we have six problem sets. The six problem sets are due uh, on, uh, generally on Mondays. And so we'll go over the problem sets in the teaching uh, sections um, a, uh, a couple days, several days after you turn them in. Uh, this is one of the biggest classes at Yale, but I think uh, we've got. Uh, it, uh, I think we've got it so it will be a good and satisfying experience with you. We have uh, very qualified. I'm very impressed with our teaching assistants. The important thing is for you to uh, stay with them and get to know them. Uh, and I urge you to attend the TA sections. The, the course is going to be graded. Uh, we have uh, two midterms and. One final, the in class midterms. The uh, grades will be s uh, roughly 10% problem sets, 20% first midterm, 30% second midterm, 40% final. Uh, but nonetheless, we will also use judgment. And I'm going to appeal to the TAs uh, to help me on judging uh, the grading. Uh, and um, so I. Uh, also, I asked the teaching assistants to give me little capsule descriptions of you, so that uh, 10 years or 20 years from now, and I get a call from a reporter asking about this illustrious person <laughs> who was once my student, uh, I, I can have something to prod my memory. Uh, so uh, that's why I hope you'll stay with, uh, you'll each find a teaching assistant and we'll stay with that person. Um, so. Uh, I wanted to say something uh, about uh, a particular interest of mine uh, because it is part of this course, although not the uh, entire uh, course. Behavioral finance refers to a revolution in finance that's occurred uh, over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, and that is uh, incorporate behavioral finance is the theory of finance mixed in with the theories of other social sciences, uh, notably uh, psychology, sociology, political science, <laughs> anthropology. Uh, it's, um, and it's, I think it's the most important revolution in finance of the last couple decades. Uh, maybe I'm biased, because I've been very much involved in it. I've been organizing workshops in behavioral finance at the National Bureau for Economic Research now since 1991 with uh, Dick Thaler at the University of Chicago. Uh, we think that we're on the vanguard of a major revolution. Uh, the unity of the social sciences is, I, I think, very important. It's, it's a mistake to try to consider finance in isolation. There is a whole uh, array of other information related to finance. So this will be a theme of my course, and of course, it's also a theme of this book here, Irrational Exuberance. Uh, that's what, what exuberance <laughs> refers to, is uh, a psychological term. So uh, that's um, uh, an important element of, of this course. Um, another thing that I will be talking about, about is uh, less important to this course, but you heard of this. <laughs> The subprime crisis. Uh, this is the big financial event which is hitting the United States and the entire world right now. Uh, and uh, I'm actually writing another book <laughs> about this. It's not done in time uh, for you to read, but uh, I think I will have it done uh, at some time during this semester. Uh, what does this mean? Subprime refers to the uh, mortgages that were made much, mostly over the last 10 years or so to subprime borrowers. A subprime borrower is somebody 
who has a poor credit history or some other indication that would suggest that they might not be able to repay the mortgage. They might default. Uh, the industry, subprime lending, has grown dramatically over the last 10 years. And as you probably know, uh, it's in big trouble now. What's happening is the housing market is dropping, home prices are falling, and people are defaulting in record numbers, and well, there are foreclosures. What happens if you don't pay your mortgage? You buy a house and you don't pay the mortgage. The contract says you lose the house, you're out. You got to pay, or you, we, it goes back to the uh, mortgage originator. Uh, and uh, this crisis is very interesting to me because it's had so many ramifications throughout the financial world. It's exposing defects in many of our biggest financial institutions. And we, every day we see more news about failures, uh, huge losses, resignations or firings of top uh, finance people. So it's a very interesting time uh, in finance. These things happen from time to time, but they happen with enough regularity that there's something that we really want to understand as a systematic, uh, as a systematic uh, uh, phen phenomenon. So that's another thing uh, that I will be talking about. Um, let me make another point about technology. All right. Finance, I believe, is a technology. And that means it is uh, a way of doing things. It has a lot of detail. A financial uh, instrument is like uh, an engineering device. Here I'm tying in out of the engineering school. Anyone here from engineering? A couple of you. <laughs> okay. Well, this could be, in fact, some engineering schools offer courses in finance. Did you know that? Engineers find it congenial because they have a way of thinking constructively about the world uh, that uh, is kind of parallel to finance. It's uh, we have theories, mathematical theories, that lead us to devise, uh, uh, devise uh, financial structures. And financial structures are complicated devices just like engines are, or nuclear reactors are. Uh, they have a lot of components. They have to work right. When people first devise some new financial instrument, it typically has trouble. Uh, and just like when they devise the first engines, or the first nuclear reactors, it didn't work so well at first. And then from experience of many people working on it over many years, a body of knowledge emerges, and that's what we call technology. So technology is a powerful force in our society, and I respect power <laughs> of this kind, uh, and that's why I like to follow it up. Uh, but technology is also dangerous. Uh, so nuclear power, for example, it may be our salvation when we run out of oil, uh, or virtually run out of oil, as seems to be coming up over the next few or several decades. We're going to have to do that. We're, uh, we're going to need nuclear power. But it's also dangerous, as you know. Uh, the same thing is true about finance. And I think that, uh, in a sense, the, uh, the subprime crisis that we have is an example of the dangers of new technology. We have been seeing financial technology advance. Uh, in recent years, and this uh, advancement of technology uh, has brought us some problems. Uh, some people want to go back. Some people think uh, there's a lot of anger about the subprime crisis, and there's some anger expressed against the financial community. Uh, I think that we should be very careful not to let that dis deflect us from the recognition that this is important technology and that it's not the technology that's at fault. We have to get it right, and then it will be powerful. Um, I've had uh, some experience uh, giving uh, talks in less developed countries. I'm not a development economist. Now, development economics, well, that's uh, Santosh's field. Uh, uh, development economics is a very important field in, in economics, which is helping 
uh, less developed countries emerge. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that Yale has a s strong department uh, at the Growth Center of, on Development Economics. Uh, I'm not a development economist. Nonetheless, when I've spoken in less developed countries, I find that they're really interested in finance. Uh, I think that's because there's a growing recognition that that's what you need to know, and that the countries that are emerging successfully are those that have well-developed financial institutions that are adopting the technology. They have to adapt it to their own situation, but in many ways, they're copying technology. And there's nothing bad about copying technology. That's what everybody does, right? When somebody invented the automobile, before you know it, everyone's driving automobiles, and they all look pretty much the same. Uh, and when someone invented the airplane, before you know it, every country has airplane. That's because there's a best practice, there's a best technology, and it's not unique to any one country. So, um, so th that's why I, I view this course as, as uh, fundamentally about technology. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's, um, uh, I wanted to say something about morality uh, and about mis mixed feelings that people have about finance. Uh, the, uh, uh, I, I note that undergraduate, I don't know if, how you feel about finance. So, some people have a reaction. If you say you're taking a course in finance, they think that maybe you're selling out, maybe you value money too much, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, you should really be in some other field. That uh, uh, th This is a long-standing uh, conflict in our thinking. There is uh, some contempt for finance, I believe, uh, because, it, because it makes so much money for many people. Many of our students go into finance. Yale is very strong in providing people to the financial community. And I have to say, they do very well. Um, and so I, my first advice is, if you want to make money, <coughs> which I don't particularly advise, <coughs> but if you do, it's not a bad idea to go into finance. Just as you, know, you can make a lot of money with organic chemistry, too. I think that what you have to do as a young person is develop your, your human capital, and that means know-how, knowing how to do things. Uh, but uh, there, is, uh, there is a hostility toward uh, finance that I think is, uh, uh, that is very uh, fundamental to a lot of our thinking. I wanted to say something about that. Uh, uh, Part of it is that some people in finance get so rich, unfortunately. If you look at the list of the richest people, uh, you know, they're all connected to finance, right? I mean, vert they understand it. Maybe they're, not, maybe they're in publishing or some other field, but they understand finance. And a lot of them are directly in finance. So what do we make of that? Well, part of it is that we get, uh, we get very... Um, uh, you know, we, we get a sort of jealousy of these people uh, because, you know, why should someone have billions of dollars? Did they really deserve that? Uh, and, you know, some people uh, get self-important um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, who make a lot of money, and uh, they end up uh, not making a lot of friends in the, in the process. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, re the Yale University Press is publishing a new book by uh, Steve Fraser about, uh, about Wall Street. Uh, and he gives examples in this book about hostility toward, it, it goes way back. Uh, so in Fraser's book, he gives an example of, uh, I've never heard of this person before, but William Durr. Uh, uh, William Durr, who was a financier uh, in colonial America. Uh, in the 1700s, um, made a lot of money and helped uh, finance the Revolutionary War in the United States, uh, but he ended up uh, being chased down the street by an angry mob. People hated him, uh, and why was it? Well, it's partly because he got so rich, uh, and he um, started wanting to show off. He had what they call liveried servants. 
uh, not just servants, but servants who were wearing livery, which means like a military uniform. <laughs> and it looked, uh, it looked like aristocracy coming back in the form of, of uh, rich uh, finan financial uh, successes. And uh, uh, we don't like that. There's a feeling of hostility toward that. Uh, and um, there's been a long discussion about what people owe each other and how okay it is to try to make money. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, I have to start erasing here. Um, one of the most uh, well known Yale professors of the 19th century was William Graham Sumner. Uh, who uh, wrote uh, a famous piece called What Social Classes Know Each Other. He, uh, Sumner graduated Yale in uh, 1863. He was a member of Skull and Bones. You've heard of that? I don't know if you know that group. Uh, spent his entire career at Yale. Uh, and he wrote, uh, he, was, he was head of our social sciences department. That's before we had uh, separate departments of economics and psychology, et cetera. Uh, and he was a very prominent uh, exponent of the idea that people uh, should go out for their own interest. They do, d one social class does not owe anything to another, and we should uh, not feel guilty about, about pursuing financial interests. Uh, but, uh, and that led to a whole attitude among, uh, among uh, a, at least a good segment of our society that it's okay to go out and make money because making money means doing productive things for the economy uh, and uh, ultimately um, it's a benefit to society. Um, but we have some discomfort with that. Uh, so, um, another book which I, I haven't put on reserve yet, but I'm going to put it on reserve, uh, is by Peter Unger, uh, who is a philosopher. It's a remarkable book called uh, Living High and Letting Die. Uh, and it refers to a more broad philosophical issue that we have, and that is that uh, most of us are really making money for ourselves. That's what we do with our lives. Uh, and uh, um, is that moral? <laughs> that, uh, it's not just rich people who do that. The rest of us do it also. Uh, and uh, in uh, Peter Unger's book, uh, he, um, uh, on the first page, he has an address. Uh, and it's an address for UNICEF which is the United Nations Children's Fund. And he starts out his book with that address where you could send money <laughs> right now. I thought it was very impressive that he put that on page one of the book because uh, it puts the reader in a moral dilemma. Uh, he points out that it's estimated that for every three dollars you send to UNICEF, you can save a life. Uh, that's because there are people in this world who are not getting medical care. There are people who are dying of diseases for which there are known cures because they don't have the medical, the, 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 the best medicines, which are often not even expensive, but they're living in such poverty. So he says, uh, why don't you stop right now and send $100 to UNICEF, okay? Um, and it was very impactful to start a book that way because I doubt that hardly any readers actually write out a check on the spot to UNICEF. Uh, and if you don't, then you are in some sense responsible for the loss of 30 lives. Uh, and so it's quite striking and it helps you to reflect on what makes us, um, what makes us uh, uh, behave the way we do. By the way, when you go back to your computer, okay, Google UNICEF, and you can give $100 to UNICEF. Uh, with it, you can do it within the hour, okay? Uh, maybe I could ask for a show of hands how many people did that. Uh, I expect that not many of you will, 
And I don't think that proves that you're bad people. This is a very interesting philosophical question. Uh, but uh, what it means is that, uh, well, there, are, there is a moral dilemma underlying all of our economic lives. Uh, and I think this moral dilemma is the same as the moral dilemma in finance. So, um, in the financial, it's just that people in finance are sometimes very successful, and they could give a lot more than $100 uh, to UNICEF. Um, so, one thing that I wanted to emphasize in this course, uh, I'll try to uh, emphasize, is that uh, part of finance uh, is actually phil philanthropy. Uh, and so, the, the most important, the most successful people in finance, I believe, end up giving the money away. Okay? And that means uh, you can't consume a billion dollars. There's no way that you can do that. What they end up, uh, you, you, you can only drive one car at a time, right? And if you have five cars, well, I mean, that's kind of. Uh, all right, you could have five cars and you could drive a different one every day, but it's starting to uh, seem a little ridiculous, right? Uh, and anyway, you're not using them and they're going to end up used by somebody else. Uh, so uh, I think the, the outcome should be philanthropy. And so those of you who are successful uh, really ought to give it away. Uh, uh, so I, I'm bringing in outside speakers as part of this course. And uh, I'm going to, uh, among them, bring in people who I think have been uh, philanthropists. Th that, that's, the, that's the mode of thinking that, um, that is most attractive when you think about uh, financial markets. Uh, so let me tell you about, I, I, I have slots now for four outside speakers. I've lined up two of them. Uh, and let me tell you uh, about the two that I've already lined up. Uh, the first one is our own David Swenson. Uh, David Swenson uh, came to uh, Yale University in uh, 1985 uh, uh, from Wall Street, although he's a, a Yale, he was a Yale graduate. Uh, at that time, the Yale endowment was uh, about, actually slightly under $1 billion. What, what is the endowment of Yale? The endowment is defined as the financial assets that Yale University owns. Okay, uh, Yale also has an art collection, which is worth uh, many billions. Uh, we don't count that as part of the endowment because they will never sell it, and so it doesn't provide income for us. And Yale also has a physical plant, like this beautiful building that we're in. That's not part of the endowment either. The financial assets that Yale has uh, at that time were about a billion dollars. Um, so. Um, since then, uh, David Swenson has invested or has managed the investment of this uh, endowment, uh, and it has uh, done phenomenally well. So it's now over $22 billion that uh, Yale has in its endowment. Uh, and so the return that he got uh, from 1996 to 2006 uh, was. Um, um, 17 percent a year on, on investments. Last year, the return on the Yale portfolio was 28 percent in one year. Uh, now, I don't know how impressed you are. The year before that, it was 22 percent in one year. Uh, now, some of this might be luck, uh, but I don't think it's all luck because he's done this consistently for so many years. If you look up around this campus now, you'll see a lot of construction. A lot of things are being spruced up and improved. Well, that's, you know, I think David Swenson has had a big hand in doing that because uh, it's having the money that uh, makes it possible. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the endowment at Yale is something like $2 million per student now. Uh, that's just sitting there as money that could be spent. Uh, and so, uh, uh, how did he do this? <laughs> that's one of the amazing things. It, it seems to have something to do, I think, with academic uh, understanding that being part of a university community uh, is a good thing for investing. Uh, and uh, you, you can see some evidence in that, in that Harvard University, Princeton University, and other universities have done extremely well on their endowments. However, 
not quite as well as Yale. Yale, I think, is the number one performer. So it's, uh, it's very interesting that we're able, it's very significant that we're able to get David Swenson. Uh, he doesn't do a lot of public speaking, but he is willing for, for uh, young people like you <laughs> to do this. Um, so uh, that's a, one of our outside speakers. He also has two books about investing that we'll talk about. Um, the second uh, uh, person I have set up now to come, although the date uh, on the syllabus uh, online is going to be changed, is Andrew Redleaf, uh, who is uh, a Yale, also a Yale graduate, uh, and who set up uh, a hedge fund called White Box Advisors uh, and has done phenomenally well uh, in investing. And uh, uh, so I think. Um, I have on the syllabus, I have a New York Times article about him. He's a very original and creative thinker uh, who looks at things from a unique perspective. Of, uh, and I, I find it very interesting talking with him because uh, to do well in investing, you have to have your own independent view of things and really be thinking about how things work. Uh, and he is someone who does that. Incidentally, the New York Times had another article about uh, Red Leaf. Uh, saying that he was really one of the first person uh, to clearly delineate the subprime crisis that we're now in. Uh, he saw it coming, and I have to say profited <laughs> from it. <laughs> if you know the subprime crisis is coming, there's always a way to profit from that. Uh, and that's what he did. But he also has a philanthropic side, so it all comes out uh, very, uh, very well. So. Uh, uh, I, I think in the remaining time, I will just go through an outline of the um, an outline of the course, um, and uh, that means uh, go through the topics of the various lectures, uh, and then I'll let you go for today. So. Um, the way this course is divided up is different than the financial theory course. If you look at John Janakopoulos' course on financial theory, uh, his mathematical concepts are central to his uh, outline of the course. But this being a financial markets course, I'm dividing it up more in terms of markets uh, and institutions. But still, I want to start with some theory. Uh, and I thought that, uh, well, I will, I plan to start by talking about uh, the, basic, the, the most basic concepts of risk management, which underlie finance. Uh, and so that will be uh, Wednesday's lecture. I call it the universal principle of risk management, pooling and the hedging of risk. Uh, I think it's the most important theoretical concept that underlies finance and insurance, uh, which we'll also talk about uh, a little bit in this course. And the idea is that if you spread risks, uh, they, they don't disappear. They're still there. But they're spread out over many people, and the impact on any one person is reduced. So the uh, basic principle of insurance is uh, if uh, each, person for ex each family suffers the risk, for example, that uh, a parent, uh, father or mother, might die, which is a terrible blow to the family. But it's not a blow to society as a whole because people die and it has a certain statistical regularity. So it makes sense that we pay families who have lost a father or mother so that they can keep going. It benefits everyone to have a, a situation in place for that. I wanted to talk about that with a little bit of reference to probability theory. And so uh, that's what uh, I will be covering. There, the, the next lecture will be among the more mathematical Although it's very elementary. If you had a course in probability and statistics, you'll find it uh, easy to follow. Uh, but it's self-contained again. Uh, I feel like I have to introduce concepts like variance and covariance and uh, correlation in order to uh, talk about finance. And that, so that's what we'll do uh, in lecture two. Uh, then the next lecture, I wanted to come back to some basic themes uh, that uh, the third lecture about uh, Technology, uh, and this relates to a, another book that I wrote. <laughs> I'm not uh, assigning it, but I wrote a book called New Financial Order uh, in 2003, 
uh, about technology and finance. And a theme of that book was that uh, I've already said this to you, but it's a very important point that financial technology is evolving and improving just the way engineering technology or biochemical technology is improving. It's getting better year by year. And uh, the uh, course of finance over uh, your lifetime will be dramatic. So uh, the financial institutions that we have 10 years from now will look very different from the ones we have now. Uh, and uh, uh, w one thing to, we have to understand in understanding the progress of financial technology is its fundamental relation to information technology. Computers, uh, the internet, communications devices are fundamental to financial progress, and they make things possible that wouldn't have been possible before. Often inventions uh, that, uh, that seem in the abstract to be good ideas may be impossible because something that you have to do to make it actually come into practice is too expensive, and so it's not economic to produce an invention. But then uh, developments in other, par in other fields can change the relative prices and suddenly make an, a, an idea that had been hypothetical and unapplied suddenly work well. So financial inventions uh, also involve experimentation, like in any other invention. Nobody knows what will work. Uh, abstract theory doesn't guide you completely. Uh, and uh, uh, once an invention is seen to work, it is rapidly copied around the world. Uh, and so we can see various breaks in financial history when some new idea suddenly was proven workable. Uh, it, it, traditionally, financial inventions were not granted patent rights, but now uh, in the United States and in a number of other countries, it's become possible to patent financial uh, inventions. Uh, I know I've done that in my, uh, in my life, uh, and so I think it's, um, uh, it gives a different perspective on, on finance. Uh, then uh, I want to talk about uh, insurance. Uh, and uh, uh, the in institution of insurance is something that really came in. It's one of the earliest, uh, um, I, I consider it a division of finance. It came really in in the 1600s when probability theory was invented. Uh, the mathematical theory of probability was unknown until that time. And you can see that uh, insurance suddenly made an appearance uh, at that time. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I, I, this will be historical and as well as theoretical uh, discussion of, of insurance. Uh, then I will move to uh, portfolio diversification uh, and supporting financial institutions. Uh, and this is, uh, again, a more theoretical lecture. It will be about the capital asset pricing model. Uh, it will be about uh, the um, uh, securities market line, about the beta, about the mutual fund theorem. Uh, but it will also be about institutions that we have, about uh, 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 investment companies and their management. So it's really parallel to an insurance discussion. Uh, insurance pools risks, uh, like life risks or fire risks, by writing policies to individual uh, policyholders. But, uh, Portfolio management pools risks in a different way by assembling a diversified portfolio or a portfolio that's negatively correlated with a risk that someone has. Uh, then I want to go to the efficient markets theory. Okay, so efficient markets is uh, a theory about, um, uh, well, it came in I, uh, about uh, three decades ago, uh, maybe it's closer to four decades ago. It's a theory that financial markets work very well and incorporate information very well. Uh, the efficient markets hypothesis was encouraged. Actually, the idea goes back over 100 years. But it, it's encouraged by the observation that financial markets seem to respond with great speed to new information. Uh, and when new information appears, prices will suddenly adjust in the financial markets. 
certain kinds of financial markets called prediction markets, which may, for example, predict the outcome of an election, have been seen to be very accurate um, predictors, uh, often better than pollsters uh, can manage. Uh, and so uh, there seems to be some uh, deep wisdom of the market. Uh, I think that is an important, efficient markets is an important concept. On the other hand, uh, and this is something that I want to uh, 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 emphasize, that you don't want to carry that too far. Uh, and that uh, one of the lessons of behavioral finance is that markets are not really efficient in a global sense. Uh, human psychology drives markets a great deal. If markets were perfectly efficient, David Swenson could not have done what he did. Uh, it would be not possible to make uh, excess returns in finance. Uh, I believe it's clear that it is, and that people who do that are people who understand more than the core efficient markets theory. They understand something about human nature, uh, how human nature interacts with our institutions. Uh, the next lecture is about behavioral uh, finance. Uh, and so I want to talk uh, in that lecture about research in psychology, uh, things that come out of the, another department here, the psychology department, which uh, have traditionally been ignored in uh, economics and finance, but are, are coming back more. Uh, I want to talk about Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory, which is a uh, uh, very important um, and this will be a little technical. A psychologists can become mathematical and technical as well. It'll be an important part of our understanding of financial markets. Uh, then I want to talk uh, in the next lecture about regulation. Uh, and that means uh, government oversight of financial markets. And not just government oversight. There are also the so-called self-regulatory organizations that are created in the financial industry to self-regulate. So uh, for example, FINRA, uh, which used to be called the National Association of Securities Dealers, is an organization, a membership organization, of uh, people in the financial community. And it imposes rules on its member. It's not a government organization, uh, but it's a regulator. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, not everyone is nice, <laughs> and not one, everyone is high-minded. Uh, and so uh, financial markets, the success of financial markets is in many ways a success of regulation. Uh, governments establish regulators who set down rules for participants in financial markets. Uh, and these rules may uh, be perceived as onerous and costly to people in the financial community. But ultimately, it's their salvation. It's what makes everything possible. Uh, after that, I want to talk about, uh, about uh, debt markets. Now, um, debt is uh, the simplest of financial instruments. It consists of a promise to pay, uh, usually in denominated in currency. And there are both long-term and short-term uh, debt instruments. The, the shortest-term uh, debt instrument in the United States is the federal funds rate which uh, is an overnight rate, one-day maturity. And uh, the longest issued by the government is a 30-year government bond. So that will be repaid three decades in the future. There have also been 100-year bonds, and there have also been perpetuities uh, that, uh, uh, in the UK, for example, the, the British consuls, which have no expiration date. They're infinite uh, maturity. Uh, so. Uh, the debt market is something worthy of study because it really represents a market for time itself. What is it that we're talking about when we talk about the rate of interest? It has units of time. It represents the price of time. And it is something that fluctuates through time as well in interesting patterns. Uh, and they are very important drivers of our economy and our lives. And uh, uh, the theory of the term structure is the theory of how interest rates differ through t uh, according to maturity or term. Uh, 
There are not only uh, debt instruments that are related to that are payable in currency. There are also indexed debt instruments that are uh, indexed to the price level, and so they give real uh, they give real interest rates. Uh, and we've had episodes in our history when real interest rates have made major moves, and these movements are very important for what is happening in our lives. Most recently, uh, for a few years a few years ago. We have, we're living in a regime of negative real interest rates uh, when the Fed was pursuing a very aggressive monetary policy. I suspect that with the subprime crisis, the Fed will be pushing real interest rates down dramatically again, and we may again be in a period of negative real interest rates. Um, after that, I want to talk about the stock market. Uh, and I wanna, uh, there's a lot to talk about. Of course, stocks are shares in companies. And they are traded on stock exchanges, uh, and uh, they're interesting uh, to analyze uh, because they, uh, they, uh, there's a sort of ambiguity about stocks that is not widely perceived by a lot of people, uh, and that is that the share repurchase uh, can change the units of measurement in a security, uh, and companies have to decide on. How leveraged the stock will be, uh, and so that changes the stock price. Leverage meaning how much debt does the company take on, uh, and moreover, companies have to decide how much dividends to pay on the stock. That's a decision of the management of the company, uh, and we have to understand how do they make that decision, and what does that mean to people who are valuing stocks. It's a very simple idea: the idea of dividing a company up into shares and selling them off. But in practice, it involves a lot of complexities. Uh, so we'll be talking about the Modigliani-Miller theorem and related uh, issues in this lecture, as well as about something about the behavior of the stock market and the tendency of it to go through dramatic movements, uh, as uh, for example it has done recently. If you've been following uh, it earlier this year, the next lecture will be about real estate. And that brings us in very much into the subprime crisis, and it, brings, it, it connects up with interests that are central to, m to my own uh, thinking. Uh, the housing market is a huge market. Right now, the total value of single-family homes in the United States is about $2 trillion. Uh, and uh, uh, the, f the market has, becoming, has been becoming increasingly speculative. Home prices have gotten unstable. So nationally, home prices in the United States rose 85 percent between 1997 and 2006 in real terms, in correct inflation corrected terms. We've seen almost a doubling in the price of the average home in the United States. Why did that happen? Now they are falling. And so in real terms, home prices have fallen almost 10 percent since the peak in 2006. This is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Many countries of the world uh, are experiencing home price booms and the beginning of what might be a home price bust. Uh, so I, I want to consider uh, the market for homes uh, and uh, also about the market for mortgages, which are the uh, instruments that finance homes, to what extent was the housing boom that we saw in recent years the result of revolution in financial technology? Uh, there's been a lot of changes in our mortgage institutions, and that might be part of the reason for the boom in home prices. Uh, and so, but there's also a question of uh, psychology. The next lecture will be, will be about banking uh, and about uh, the uh, the supply of money, uh, the money multiplier. Uh, it's about uh, how banks operate, what their function is in our society, why are they such important institutions that have gone back for hundreds of years uh, and remain powerful, central fe features in our economy. It's also about bank regulation, such things as the Basel Accord, Basel I and Basel II. I want to also talk about the impact of information and technology on banking. Uh, the next lecture is about monetary policy. 
uh, the, uh, what do central banks do? In the United States, the central bank is called the Federal Reserve. Uh, in the United Kingdom, it's the Bank of England. In Japan, it's the Bank of Japan. In the, uh, and in Europe, it's the European Central Bank. Uh, all of these banks are really in control of short-term interest rates, uh, and these interest rates are used to try to, uh, to manage and stabilize the economy. Uh, in response to the subprime crisis that we are now in, our central bank, the Federal Reserve, has been cutting interest rates aggressively to try to save an economy that appears to be declining. I want to try to understand, in that lecture, help us understand how uh, this works and uh, how we're getting, uh, uh, how we're getting uh, uh, solutions or, or possible solutions to these problems. Then I want to talk about investment banking. Now, an investment bank is a different kind of bank. Uh, I was talking up to this point about commercial banks. An investment bank is not a bank that accepts deposits. It doesn't deal with the general public. It deals instead with financial institutions, uh, and it gets involved in uh, underwriting of securities for financial institutions. It's a very important industry, and it's also one that many of our students uh, have uh, found jobs in. So I, I think it's important for us to try to understand uh, the, the history of investment banks, the role that they have in our financial uh, community, uh, and how they're regulated. Uh, then I want to talk about money managers, professional money managers, people like David Swenson. Uh, these are people, a community of people in a different segment of the, in, of the financial <coughs> industry. These are people who manage portfolios. Uh, and uh, uh, we want to think about what kinds of forces operate on them, what kind of um, I'm interested in, uh, in viewing them partly as people who are very expert in a certain kind of technology, who live in a very competitive environment, uh, and try to understand why some of them succeed much more than others. But it also relates to behavioral finance, uh, and that is that uh, ultimately they are human beings like anyone else, and some of their differences in success or failure may have to do with their own uh, interconnections and their own uh, 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 psychology and interpersonal psychology. Uh, then I want to talk about brokerages. Those are uh, institutions that, that arrange for or manage the buying and selling of financial assets, such things as the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, now the brokerage industry the New York Stock Exchange goes back into the 18th century. It's very old. And in fact, the idea of a stock exchange goes back to the 14th century, uh, when in Flanders, the first stock exchange called the Bourse uh, was uh, established. So it goes back many hundreds of years. But it's in rapid change now because of information technology. And uh, it's one of the most uh, rapidly changing, hard to keep up with areas. Uh, because someone can set up an electronic exchange overnight and suddenly become uh, a, a, a base for uh, trading of trillions of dollars uh, of, uh, of securities. Uh, so that's, it, it fits in well with the theme of this course about technology, because in understanding what's happening with brokerages, uh, our technology, uh, the, the, the new information technology, is central. Then I want to move to futures markets and forward markets. Uh, and uh, uh, a, a forward contract is a contract made between two parties for execution in the future. Uh, they're called, generally these are called over-the-counter contracts because they're not arranged through exchanges. We also have standardized contracts that are traded on exchanges, and they're called futures contracts. Uh, Futures contracts were invented in Japan in the 1600s at Osaka, uh, and they were uh, developed for the rice market in Japan. They were uniquely Japanese until pretty much the 19th century, and then they were copied all over the world uh, and are now very important. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one futures market that uh, I have been instrumental in developing. I've been working with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange 
to create a futures market for single family homes. Uh, and that's sort of my connection to the futures industry. Uh, but of course, there are many futures markets, and we'll talk about. Uh, they're very interesting to me, uh, and I wonder why the business community isn't more aware of it. But a futures market has a prediction uh, going out years into the future of what every financial variable will be doing. So you can see the future, in a sense, through the futures prices. Uh, it's not always correct to think of it that way, but uh, we have to get into the theory of futures markets. In many cases, that is not the right way to think about futures prices. But there are very important futures markets that uh, uh, there are. Uh, and so in the next lecture, I want to talk about uh, the, uh, number, the various kinds of futures markets that matter. We have a stock index futures market, and notably, we have an oil futures market. Uh, the oil futures market uh, is very significant bec uh, because it represents the price of energy on dates into the future. We can now see the price of oil going out years into the future. We've just hit a $100 barrel price of oil. Uh, but what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to live in a world with $100 oil? Well, not if you look at the futures market, which is in backwardation now and is predicting major drops in the oil price of oil. Uh, then I want to talk about options markets. This is getting close to the end of the course. An option is the right to buy something. Typically, we think of it as a stock option. Uh, an option is a contract that says you can buy uh, so many shares of, of, a, of a company. Uh, the options have been traded uh, now for several decades. At the, starting with the Chicago Board Options Exchange, but now many options exchanges. Uh, and we have prices of options that change minute by minute. And what do these changes in these prices mean? Uh, and the uh, options are very useful technology for managing of risks. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that we'll see a, a rapid, over the next few decades, we'll see rapid expansion in the scope of options contracts traded on the exchanges. And finally, the last lecture for this semester, I want to talk about, uh, pull this together and talk about one of the themes that uh, uh, or summarize in terms of a theme of this course, which is the democratization of finance. Uh, finance used to be a very esoteric field that only a few people in London and Paris and uh, other world centers understood. It has in Amsterdam and other uh, his, places where uh, financial technology emerged. But it's becoming democratized. With each year that goes by, the concepts of finance are being applied more broadly and involving more and more people. With electronic technology, it's becoming more economical to offer sophisticated financial services to everyone. And this is a thing that we're seeing. I think. Uh, the subprime crisis that is the current financial crisis uh, highlights this very well. What does subprime mean? Well, I think it stands for the, the general population. The subprime mortgage market was bringing people in to the mortgage market who in prior decades would not have been involved, would not have had any mortgage. Uh, the problem, of course, with the democratization of finance is that the, if you raise the participation in financial markets, you bring in people who are less and less knowledgeable and less and less understanding of concepts of finance and less capable and more vulnerable to uh, exploitation. So the democratization of finance is, I think, the ultimate mission of, uh, that I find central to this course. But it brings with it dangers and hazards, and we have to think very carefully about how we do it.